Here's Tertullian in a work against Hermogenes. Hermogenes was arguing that God created everything from pre-existing matter. Tertullian is disagreeing with that. He says, I revere the fullness of his scripture. So he's saying scripture is full. It has a fullness to it in which he manifests to me both the creator and the creation. In the gospel, moreover, I discover a minister and witness of the creator, even his word. But whether all things were made out of any underlying matter, I have as yet failed to find anywhere or failed anywhere to find. So he's saying, you know, scripture is, I, I have a fullness in scripture. It tells me of the creator and it tells me of his word, right? These I find testified to in scripture, but I don't find anything about this underlying matter that God used to create things. Where such a statement is written, Hermogenes' shop must tell us. He's he's referring to Hermogenes' shop, like there's this shop where he he uh, he creates these ideas, right? You know, just like an idol factory. Hermogenes is is creating stuff, and Tertullian saying, "Where such a statement is written, Hermogenes' shop must tell us. If it is nowhere written, then let it fear the woe which impends on all who add to or take away from the written word." Notice the very point that Tertullian is making in this statement is that Scripture contains a fullness. It is sufficient to tell us what we need to know about God our Creator and His Word by whom we are redeemed. And notice one can't say Tertullian is just referring to Revelation as fullness, because by that out people mean Revelation is inclusive of the written word and oral tradition. But Tertullian's explicit. He's referring to the scripture. He's referring to the written word. It tells us what we need to know, and we are not to add to it or take from it. Here's Tertullian again on the resurrection of the flesh. He, therefore, will not be a Christian who shall deny this doctrine which is confessed by Christians. Denying it, moreover, on grounds which are adopted by a man who is not a Christian. Take away, indeed, from the heretics the wisdom which they share with the heathen, and let them support their inquiries from the scriptures alone. They will then be unable to keep their ground. So Tertullian here is saying that the heretics must not be allowed to ground their claims on those opinions that they share with the heathen, away with the heathen and their claims. Tertullian says the truth must be grounded on the scriptures alone. Here's Marius Victorinus in his work on the Trinity, quote, that such is the faith with the permission of God and Jesus and the Holy Spirit we shall affirm. Let no one say, understanding me in a blasphemous way, that it is my own teaching. Indeed, all that I say is said by Holy Scripture and comes from Holy Scripture. So Marius Victorinus is saying that he can't be opposed on the grounds that this comes from him. It comes from Scripture, and in fact, he says that everything that he's putting forward comes from Holy Scripture. He's not making his appeal to anything outside of it, beyond it, and certainly not against it. Here is a quotation from Cyril of Alexandria. Sufficient, sufficient for this are the scriptures of the Holy Fathers, which if anyone would diligently study and vigilantly attend to, he would immediately have his mind filled with divine light. For they did not speak of themselves, but all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable. Notice Cyril, in talking about the sufficiency of scripture, even points to the very text that Protestants classically point to. This is the locus classicus of Protestant appeals when trying to show that sola scriptura is the teaching of the Bible. 2 Timothy 3.16, all scripture is God-breathed or given by inspiration of God and is profitable. Cyril, speaking of scripture sufficiency, points to the same text. This was not originated by Luther and Calvin and Zwingli and Beza and Knox and Farrell and all those other greats of the faith. This was something that had been taught by earlier giants even men such as Tertullian, Marius Victorinus, and Cyril. Here is a quote from Augustine. Augustine says, As regards our writings, which are not a rule of faith or practice, but only a help to edification, that's the point I was making before, right? Read other things. They are a help to edification. Sometimes 
they will be a help in the sense that they'll say something that's wrong and it'll challenge you, but they also might challenge you and get you to correct your own position. There are all sorts of benefits to reading others, even though other writings are subordinate to scripture, they are edifying. And this by Christ's divine design, right? In Ephesians 4, scripture says that Christ gave some to be apostles, some prophets, you know, but some teachers as well, teachers in the church. And obviously teachers are not on the same level as apostles and prophets, but they serve a purpose. Christ uses them to build up the body, but they're not infallible. Okay? We may suppose that they contain some things falling short of the truth in obscure and recondite matters. He's talking about his own writings. And that these mistakes may or may not be corrected in subsequent treatises. Uh, by the way, Augustine, he gets the award for a work that he wrote called Retractationis. Okay, that's Latin for retraction or rethinking. And it's basically a work of Augustine where he's looking back upon his life's work up to that point and taking issue with himself and telling people about things that he's now thought through and thinks he has come to a better idea on them. Imagine if more people did that sort of thing. Well, Augustine did that. Augustine wrote a whole book saying, yeah, I wrote this here. I don't agree with myself anymore on that point. Right? But that shows you that not even Augustine's infallible. And Augustine's anticipating such a work when he talks this way. He says his writings aren't infallible. He, he expects there to be mistakes and hopes to correct them in subsequent treatises. He goes on, for we are of those of whom the apostle says, and if you be otherwise minded, God shall reveal even this unto you. Such writings are read with the right of judgment and without any obligation to believe. In order to leave room for such profitable discussions of difficult questions, there is a distinct boundary line separating all productions subsequent to apostolic times from the authoritative canonical books of the Old and New Testaments. The authority of these books has come down to us from the apostles through the successions of the bishops and the extension of the church and from a position of lofty supremacy claims the submission of every faithful and pious mind. If we are perplexed by an apparent contradiction in scripture, it is not allowable to say the author of this book is mistaken, but either the manuscript is faulty or the translation is wrong, or you have not understood. This, by the way, is, is very sage wisdom that Augustine is giving here. When you run across something in Scripture that strikes you as problematic, there are a number of ways that you can properly deal with this. The one thing you cannot say is the author of this book is mistaken. If you are embracing this as the Word of God, it's impossible to be consistent with that affirmation to say that the book is mistaken. But there are other op options. Number one, it could be that the, the manuscript you're looking at is faulty. It, there's a variant there that doesn't represent the original autograph, in which case you now need to do your homework and see what the, the best reading there is. Or it could be that you're looking at the translation and the translation is lacking. Or it could simply be that you haven't understood it. Imagine the thought, right, that you could have possibly misunderstood something. Nobody likes to do that, but it's it's what Augustine is saying is a live, viable option, whereas saying the Bible is mistaken is not. He goes on to say, in the innumerable books that have been written latterly, we may sometimes find the same truth as in Scripture, but there is not the same authority. Books that have been written after Scripture might even agree with Scripture, but they don't carry the same authority. Scripture has a sacredness peculiar to itself. In other books, the reader may form his own opinion, and perhaps, from not understanding the writer, may differ from him, and may pronounce in favor of what pleases him, or against what he dislikes. In such cases, a man is at liberty to withhold his belief, unless there is some clear demonstration or some canonical authority to show that the doctrine or statement either must or may be true. But in consequence of the distinctive peculiarity of the sacred writings, we are bound to receive as true whatever the canon shows to have been said by even one prophet or apostle or evangelist. Otherwise, not a single page will be left for the guidance of human fallibility if contempt for the wholesome authority of the canonical books either puts an end to that authority altogether or involves it in hopeless confusion.